3,000 years ago, the Chinese used a laborious method of drilling for salt. The drillers jumped on and off a springboard. This raised the drilling tool and then let it pound into the earth. It was like driving a nail into a piece of wood. This principle was used in the early days of drilling for oil. A walking beam lifted and dropped the drill tool to make a hole. Cable tool drilling, as this was called, was slow and unsatisfactory. Later it was found better to bore a hole into the ground by using a rotary drill, like a brace and bit. With modern equipment, it's possible to reach a depth of over three miles. Here, preparations are being made for sinking the first well in a new area. An experimental well of this kind is known as a wild cat. Everything needed for the job may have to be transported hundreds of miles along specially built roads. After months of prospecting, geologists have decided that this is a possible oil-bearing locality, and now their findings are being put to the test. In spite of all the geologists' accumulated skill, the chances are 10 to 1 against success. When the derrick has been erected, drilling can begin. A steam or diesel engine drives a round steel plate, called a rotary table, with a square hole in the center. A square pipe, called the kelly, fits through the hole and is free to move down as it's rotated. Attached to the lower end of the kelly, is a string of drill pipe, which is lengthened at intervals as the well gets deeper. At the end of the drill string is a drill collar, and below this, the bit. Different types of bits are used according to the kind of strata being cut. Special mud is circulated by pumps which force it up a flexible pipe to a swivel joint at the top of the kelly. The mud is forced down inside the drill string to the bottom of the well, where it lubricates and cools the bit, and then returns to the surface between the drill pipe and the sides of the hole. This mud is very important because it prevents the well from caving in and carries the drill cuttings from the bottom of the well. The cuttings are examined continually since they show the type of strata being penetrated. When the drilling bit becomes worn, it has to be replaced. This means pulling up the drill string section by section, a long job calling for high standards of teamwork. bit is attached, then the sections of the drill string are reconnected and lowered into the well again.
means trouble. The weeks of work put into the well may be wasted. A special socket is lowered in the hope that it will take a grip of the broken end. Several kinds of fishing tool may have to be used before the fish is caught. Sometimes the fishing is unsuccessful and the engineers must decide whether to abandon the well altogether or to try to bypass the broken drill string by means of a whipstock. A whipstock is a beveled piece of steel shaped to deflect the drill at an angle. With the bypass safely accomplished, drilling continues. At intervals, a core-taking barrel is lowered down the middle of the drill string on the end of a cable. The core barrel slices out a sample of the rock formation and is pulled back to the surface. The cores are examined to ascertain the type of rock being penetrated. This one is mainly water-bearing rock with only minor oil stains, so drilling must go on. Electric logging instruments are used to make a record of the character and fluid content of the formation. This and the samples obtained with the core barrel will give the geologist a continuous picture of the underground strata. It will also be useful for comparison when other wells are drilled in the same area. At last oil is reached and the well is lined with a metal casing. Cement is forced down the hole and up between the casing and the sides of the well. When the cement is set hard, a gun perforator is lowered. Bullets pierce the steel casing and cement so that any oil present will run into the well. A system of control valves called a Christmas tree is fitted to the top. Oil or water is forced down to flush out the mud and then it's a question of wait and see. If the wildcat well proves that petroleum deposits are present in worthwhile quantities, the next job is to get the crude petroleum out of the ground and into the refineries. This means making roads and communications, drilling additional wells, laying pipelines, building storage tanks and processing plants. Here's a typical well. The derrick has been removed and all that remains is the Christmas tree. Oil is found not in underground lakes, but in porous rock or sand, beneath a layer of impervious rock which prevents it from escaping. There's usually water present, and since water is the heavier, the oil will lie above the water. There's also gas, 
some dissolved in the oil and some trapped above it. Now suppose a well reaches oil bearing sand. What follows is like the action of a soda water siphon. When the valve on ground level is opened, the gas expands and drives the oil mixed with gas to the surface. Suppose another well is drilled which misses the oil sands and strikes the gas cap. Well number two is like a siphon in which the tube is too short. It can produce only gas. It shut down because all the gas is needed for driving the oil out through well number one. Expanding gas is not the only force which drives oil to the surface. In some fields, water exerts pressure from below, forcing the oil up. As production continues, the pressure of gas or water falls. The well may flow for years, but sooner or later, the pressure will become insufficient to force the oil to the surface, and artificial methods must be used to assist the flow. One method is called gas lift assistance. Gas is pumped down through the casing and pushes the mixture of oil and gas up through the flow string to the surface. In the next stage, the well must be pumped. The engines that drive the pumps are sometimes worked by natural gas from the field. A walking beam moves a string of sucker rods up and down. Valves at the bottom of these rods open and close with the movement of the pump and the oil is raised to the surface. The pumps have to stand a lot of rough treatment from sand and corrosion. Periodically, a pump has to be replaced and a portable derrick rig is used to pull up the long sucker rod string. These portable rigs are also useful for such jobs as replacing broken tubing, bailing sand out of the wells, repairing holes in the well casing, and all the other repairs needed to keep the wells producing. Apart from these methods of increasing the production of individual wells, it's sometimes possible to prolong the life of a whole field by repressuring. Large quantities of gas can be pumped into the ground to restore some of the original gas pressure. Similarly, where water pressure has been predominant, water can be pumped in to force up the oil. What happens to the crude petroleum when it leaves the well is shown by this model. From the Christmas tree at the top of the well, the mixture of oil, gas and water flows to a gas trap. The gas trap separates the gas from the water and oil. The wet gas goes to an absorption plant. Here it's dried by extracting liquid products such as natural gasoline, propane, butane, and isobutane. From the absorption plant, the dried gas supplies homes and factories with heat and power. So much for the gas. From the other outlet of the gas trap, the mixture of oil and water flows to a settling tank. Here the water is removed. The oil goes to storage tanks. Samples are sent to a laboratory where tests are made to determine its quality and value. Finally, from the storage tanks, the oil passes through a pumping station to the refineries. The job of production is finished.